Today, we are going to be reviewing for your chapter 11 test. You get to use your notes on your test. So I would recommend that you take notes as you watch this video and write down any information that you do not know by heart. The first thing we learned in chapter 11 was three different types of data displays. On your test, you won't be making the data displays, but you will be answering questions about each of the data displays in general, and you also might have to interpret some information based on a data display that's given to you. The first type of data display that we learned about was a dot plot. Remember that dot plots show us all the individual data values. You can see all of the exact values by looking at the dots on the dot plot. This dot plot here shows quiz scores that students got on a 10 point quiz. You can see that one student got a three out of 10 and one student got a 10 out of 10. It shows all the exact values for each of the students. You can also see where the data is clustered. Remember that a cluster is the area where most of the data lies. For this particular graph, the cluster would be seven through nine. You can also clearly see where outliers are based on a dot plot. Remember that an outlier is a value that's very different from all the other data in the set. Here we have an outlier of three. All of the other students scored between six and 10 on their quiz, but one student scored quite lower with a three out of 10. All of these things are advantages of a dot plot. The best thing about the dot plot is we can see all of the individual data values, but the downfall of a dot plot is that it's not easy to identify the mean or the median just by looking at the dot plot. If you wanted to find the mean or the median, you would need to do a long calculation by hand, or you would need to input all of the data into a graphing calculator or Desmos and calculate it that way. The second type of data display that we learned about was a histogram. Remember that histograms are useful when you wanna see data grouped in intervals. Here's an example of a histogram that shows the prices of meal options at Bob's Burgers. Notice the intervals for the meal prices. Some meals cost between six and eight dollars, and some meals cost between nine and eleven dollars, and so on. We can see the frequency of each of the intervals. So because six through eight has a frequency of two, that means there are two meal options that are between six and eight dollars. With a histogram, we can also see the intervals where the data is clustered. So you can look at the histogram and find the bars that are the highest. Here, most of the data is in the 12 through 14 interval or the 15 through 17 interval. So we say that the cluster would be these two intervals. You can also look at a histogram and easily identify its shape. The two main shapes are symmetric or skewed. For this particular graph, you can see that the high point of the graph is on the right side and the low flat part that we call the tail is on the left. So this graph here would be skewed left. The disadvantage of a histogram though is that it does not show any exact values. If we look at this particular histogram, we have no way of calculating the mean or the median because we don't even know the exact values. We just know that two meals are between $6 and $8, but we don't know if one of them might be $6.50 and another might be $7.99. We have no idea. We also can't identify the maximum or the minimum value because we don't have any exact values. We just know that the minimum value is somewhere between $6 and $8, and that the maximum value is somewhere between $15 and $17. We also cannot find the range or the standard deviation because all of these things require us to have the exact data values, and just by looking at a histogram, we don't have any of those exact values. The final type of data display that we learned about was a box and whisker plot. Box and whisker plots are also called box plots. The advantage of a box plot is that it gives us five key values. The first of those values is the minimum. 
The minimum is just the smallest value. We can also find the first quartile that's abbreviated with Q1. And the first quartile is just the middle of the lower half of the data. Next, we can find the median. The median is the middle of the entire data set. The third quartile, which is abbreviated Q3, is the middle of the upper half of the data. Finally, we can identify the maximum, which is the largest value. These five values are the five key points on the box plot. The minimum and the maximum are the whiskers, so the min is the leftmost whisker, and the maximum is the rightmost whisker. The Q1 is the left edge of the box. So here, the Q1 would be here, and the Q3 is the right edge of the box. The median is the middle dot, which is the line going through the box. I'm going to write in the values for each of these numbers. The minimum is at five. You just look at where that goes on the number line. Q1 is at nine. The median is at 12. Q3 is at 14. And the maximum is at 17. Box plots also divide data into 25% sections. There are four sections on your graph. 25% of your data is going to be between the minimum and the first quartile. The next 25% is going to be between Q1 and the median. Then the next 25% is between the median and Q3. And our highest 25% of the data is between Q3 and the maximum. This allows us to make statements like 75% of the data is between 5 and 14. Because if we look at the sections on the graph, 5 to 14 is 25% of the data, then another 25%, and another 25%. So add that together, 25 plus 25 plus 25 is 75%. We could also make a statement like half the data is between 9 and 14 because 9 and 14 is the box section of our box and whisker plot and 25% plus 25% is 50% or half of our data values. Box plots also allow us to calculate the range. The range is just the maximum value minus the minimum value. And with a box plot, you can find the max and the min by looking at the whiskers. For this box and whisker plot, the range would be equal to the maximum value of 17 minus the minimum value of 5. And 17 minus 5 is equal to 12. We can also calculate the interquartile range. The interquartile range is the range of the middle 50% of the data. You find it by taking the difference between Q3 and Q1. So for this particular graph, our interquartile range would be equal to Q3, which is 14, minus Q1, which is nine, and 14 minus nine is equal to five. We can also identify the shape of a box and whisker plot and decide whether it's symmetric or skewed. The disadvantage of a box and whisker plot, though, is that it does not show us any exact values. So make sure that you remember that. Box and whisker plots do not show exact individual data values. The only exact values that you have from a box and whisker plot are the minimum value and the maximum value. We do not know about any of the other values in between there. The next thing we learned about in this chapter was the different shapes for data distributions. The first shape is symmetric. Symmetric graphs are graphs that are evenly distributed. If you connect this with a smooth curve, you'll see it has that kind of hill shape. And you'll also see how the halves of that graph are roughly equal to each other. 
for any graph that's symmetric, the mean will be equal to the median or very close to equal. They will not always be the exact same. This next graph is uniform. A uniform graph is a graph where all of the data is the exact same height or really close to the same height. Because uniform graphs are also symmetric, the mean will be equal to the median. Next, a graph is skewed left if it's flat on the left side and it gets higher on the right side. Remember that the name for the skew is the direction of the tail. Here, the tail or flat part of the graph is on the left, so this graph is called skewed left. Whenever a graph is skewed left, the mean is going to be pulled toward the tail. So our mean is going to get smaller and the mean will always be less than the median for any graph that is skewed left. If a graph is skewed right, that's the opposite. We have most of our values on the left side and then it gets flat as we go off to the right. The tail is on the right, so we call it skewed right. And the mean is always pulled toward the tail. And since the tail is larger numbers, for a skewed right distribution, the mean will always be greater than the median. These shapes also apply to box plots. If a box plot is symmetric, it's going to be evenly distributed so that the whiskers are the same length or close to the same length, and it'll look something like that. If it's skewed left, you're going to see a long tail or whisker on the left side of the graph. If a box plot is skewed right, the long whisker is going to be on the right side, so that would look something like this. You'll need to know these three distribution shapes that I'm highlighting. Symmetric, skewed left, and skewed right for your test. You'll also need to know how the mean and median are related. For symmetric, the mean is always equal to the median. For skewed left, the mean is always less than the median. And for skewed right, the mean is always greater than the median. The final thing we learned in this chapter was standard deviation. Standard deviation works best when data is normally distributed. A graph is said to be normally distributed when it makes a bell-shaped curve. So this graph here is bell-shaped, so we would consider it to be normally distributed. Standard deviation is a measure of spread. Standard deviation shows how the data varies from the mean. So it shows how far the data values are spread out from the mean. To calculate the standard deviation, we use Desmos or a graphing calculator. You do not need to calculate standard deviation by hand. On Desmos, we type or click STDEVP and then enter all of the data values in the parentheses separated by commas. Let's look at this example here and review how to use Desmos. Let's find the mean and the standard deviation of this data set. Go to desmos.com and click the blue graphing calculator button. Once you're there, to find the mean, we can type out the word mean and then put a left parenthesis and then just type the values in the parentheses separated by commas. So one, one, four, five, six, seven, ten, eleven. Hit enter, and that gives us a mean of 5.625. Let's round that to one decimal and say the mean is 5.6. To find the standard deviation, we can type STDEVP and then a parenthesis, and then type the same values there. I'm going to just copy and paste those since our list is the same. Hit enter and there we can see our standard deviation is about 3.4618. I'm going to again round that to one decimal place so the standard deviation would be about 3.5. 
You will have a question on your test later where you'll need to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, and you should use Desmos to do that. The last thing I want to review with you today is the different measures of center and spread. There are three different measures of center. The mean is just the average of the data values. The median is the middle data value. And the mode is the value that occurs the most often. There are also three different measures of spread. The range is the difference between the maximum and the minimum values. To find the range, we just take the maximum minus the minimum. The standard deviation is the measure that tells us how the data is spread out from the mean. To find the standard deviation, you're going to use Desmos or a graphing calculator. The interquartile range is the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. To calculate the interquartile range, you take Q3 minus Q1. If you add a constant to each data value in a data set, the measures of center are going to increase by that same constant. So the mean, median, and mode would all go up by the same value that you add to each of the individual data values. The measures of spread, though, are going to stay the same. So the range, standard deviation, and interquartile range would not change if we added a constant to each of the values in a data set. Here's an example. Suppose we have a data set with a mean of 10, a median of 9, a range of 7, and a standard deviation of 3. If we add 2 to each of the data values in this set, the mean and the median would both increase by that same constant. So since we're adding 2, the mean and the median, which are both measures of center, would also go up by 2. And 10 plus 2 would make the new mean be 12. And 9 plus 2 would make the new median be 11. The range and standard deviation, though, are measures of spread. And the measures of spread are going to stay the same if we add 2 to each data value. So our range would stay at 7, and our standard deviation would stay at 3. Now we've finished our review of all the important information from Chapter 11. Remember that any notes that you took down during this video can be used on the test. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your test later. Bye!